Okay, look, I have a new warning for all professional wrestlers and all professional wrestling fans that should decide to go to an AEW show at any time, either now or in the future, given everything that's going on pandemic. But if you see Lance Archer and then realize there is a ceiling or a roof above your head, you will need to run away and you will need to run away faster than you've ever run away in your damn life. And we will talk about that when we get there, but for the time being, my name is Simon Miller. Welcome to What Culture Wrestling. It's lovely to see your face because I'm standing behind you. <laughs> I'm not, but AEW just had another show. It's called Dynamite. So to put it to bed for real, we've got to give the good bits an up and we've got to give the, that's right, the bad bits are down. I talk to my own finger, let's up those downs. Dynamite started with the TNT Open Challenge and All Elite Wrestling had done a great job all week of promoting this because they had spent pretty much every day on social media going, you're not going to believe who the mystery challenger is. It's one of the best independent wrestlers ever. So the whole time I was like, oh my gosh, who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? Even John Moxley had done interviews and saying, man, when you find this out, hardcore fans are going to lose their ship and even casual fans will be introduced to one of wrestling's best. You know what? I absolutely agree. This is getting it up. Why? Because it was my man, your man, everybody's man, Eddie Kingston. Also my friend, and you will know what I'm talking about if you remember when What Culture went to the original and the first star cast, and he just decided to interrupt one of our interviews. I haven't forgot you, Eddie. Although, given what you did last night, you do whatever the hell you want. He's also one of a kind when it comes to talking on a microphone because you can believe every single flipping word he said. He looked at Cody and said, oh, you pretend that you grind and you've got this horrible backstory, but really you're privileged and look who's next to you, Arn Anderson, a once but not now legend. He was firing shots like he had no more shots to fire. He is obviously here to challenge for the TNT Championship, although Eddie wanted a no disqualification match. And even though I bet Cody regrets it this morning, he did indeed say, all right. We weren't mucking around at all either, because I think within the first five minutes, we'd seen Eddie Kingston whip Cody with his own weight belt, and then somebody went flying into the concrete floor, Rhodes himself got whammed in the balls, and you never want to get whammed in the balls. It always hurts. It's one of those things. Everyone's going to live, everyone's going to die, everyone's got to pay taxes, and if you get hit in the hoo-ha area, you will start to cry. So this was an absolute war, and even Cody's chest was red raw quicker than Mojo Rawley loses a match. I mean, this was just... Well, it was nuts. It then ramped up even further because we had thumbtacks. Thumbtacks for the second time within seven days because Impact was doing this on Slammiversary and now AEW doing it, I can't handle thumbtacks. Obviously, that's the point. But as soon as somebody gets thrown into them, I make a noise like a pigeon that's about to be run over. It's just like... And then, you know, I get run over visually. It makes me feel a bit... Ugh. And they both went into these as well because Kingston powerbombed Cody and he was rolling around like a crazy person. And then later on, he was getting slammed into them as well. So when they went backstage, they would have just had metal in them. Nobody wants metal in them unless you're Iron Man. But he didn't really have metal in them. What are we talking about? Also, don't forget, you can't fake this, folks. It is just a pointy nightmare. And amazingly, and somewhat astoundingly, this actually finished when, with all the damn thumbtacks sticking into both of them, Cody applied the figure four. Eddie Kingston has to tap out. What a just crazy mad way to start AEW Dynamite. But it got my fires flared. And I don't even know what that means. But I will say this, if you weren't aware who Eddie Kingston was, now you damn sure are. And for a while there, he was even trending on Twitter with the hashtag sign Eddie Kingston. So you got to admit, this was a success. We zoomed to Mr. Moxley after this, who was cutting a promo, and he is still very mad at Brian Cage. And that made me go, hmm, interesting. Because he had promised us that he would rip the arm from Cage's body, but he wasn't able to do that because of Taz, who obviously threw in the towel. Now, while John can understand that this did go down, he did make a promise to his fans. So now he's doubling down on that promise. And next time, he says something crazy, like he's going to pop it like a balloon. I don't want to see that. That sounds disgusting. He also said that because of everything Taz had done, he should become manager of the year. And yeah, if you're wondering if this feud was going to continue, well, this made it clear and we got more evidence later on. MJF was then out. And while I still think it would be a good idea if on Dynamite, they showed clips from Dark and from BTE on YouTube because we keep referencing them. 
all of this here was absolutely fabu. And the main reason for that is that if you have been watching Being the Elite on that there old YouTube, which we're on now, the storyline and everything the Dark Order doing with Griff Garrison has been genuinely laugh out loud funny. So when I saw Griff Garrison in the ring with MJF, I just knew I was going to have a good time, and damn it, I did. Up. Because basically, everybody keeps mistaking Griff for Jungle Boy because they have the same kind of hair, even though Garrison is about 10 foot 2 and Jungle Boy is not. So MGF kicked this off by saying, Oh, Griff Garrison, you're so great. It's so good to see you. Do not forget that right now, you are in the ring with an undefeated superstar. Because Griff could be crazy. He got the microphone and went, Didn't you lose like some kind of tag team match a few months ago? That pissed Maxwell off and he punched him in the face. And this was mostly just a squash match as MJF just piled on the pressure to Griff Garrison and he even mocked him at one point and said, you need to admit that I am undefeated. And I guess that Griff was in so much pain, he was like, I admit it, I admit it. Didn't stop this absolute beating though. Friedman gave him the Heat Seeker, which is a very cool move by the way, and he got the win. So in his world, he is still undefeated. I have a feeling all of this could be building to MJF taking on John Moxie for the world title eventually. And what a little razzmatazz that will be, because I don't think we'd be able to call it. We shall wait and see, but it does make sense. We had a small segment with Britt Baker, Rebel, and Tony Schiavone then. And look, we all know this was going to be fun. We all know this was going to be entertaining, and therefore it's very fun and entertaining. Britt Baker was telling us about the fourth rule of being a role model, which is why you never count a role model out, and she is going to rise again like Tiger Woods and like Michael Jordan. As we know, although we don't talk about it, that didn't go very well. Either way, she is going to be back by the All Out pay-per-view, and I'm going to keep everything crossed. That is true. Britt Baker kicking all the ass. Taz and Cage were then out to the ring to create some more chaos, and I think they did. Up. And it was most to underline that even though they had fallen out for a period, Brian Cage now understands why Taz did indeed throw in the towel, so they're still going to be friends. They then hugged and gave each other a flower, and I made that last bit up. Because Taz's main point was that they're never going to be in this situation again, because Brian Cage is never going to be put in that position again, because instead, he is just going to kill everyone he sees. Him and Lance Archer, but again, we'll talk about that soon. He also put over the FTW Championship and Brian simultaneously by saying, the reason Cage wasn't going to tap out is because that's his mindset and the mindset of an FTW champion is exactly that. So that was nice. It's a bit like wrestling maths. So all of this did come across like the man who loves Orange was doing what's best for his client even though his client didn't see it at first. And I think that adds a layer of depth there. It's better than just being buddy buddy the whole time. That's not how life works. We all fall out with our friends and then we regret it and they die. This is the second time I've talked about friends dying this week. Darby Allen then arrived because, of course, he wants mad revenge on Brian Cage for all those terrible things that he's done. But do you know who stepped in to help Brian Cage? It was Ricky Starks, who we haven't really seen recently. However, we have been seeing him on Dark, and this is where this pairing first came to fruition. So I just want to call back to that point made earlier. Start showing these clips. It will make everything feel better connected. I don't know why I love those two together as well, but for some reason it just makes sense and it's a cool visual. And when they were going to take Darby Allen's skateboard and ram it into his throat, because of course that's what he did last week, you know who came out to make the save. It was John Moxley. And that's a nice little wink and nod to last week. Because, of course, Darby Allen saved John, and now John is saving Darby. Sometimes simplicity is the best, and if this builds to a bunch of tag team matches between all four of those guys, I mean, it will continue the Brian Cage and John Moxley feud, but it will also allow Darby Allen and Ricky Starts to take a few steps up the ladder. Like I say, sometimes just do what's obvious, and I'll have a good old time. I don't know what this is. Chris Jericho was then being interviewed backstage, and he is livid that his white jacket, his $7,000 white jacket, is now orange. And the reason it has changed colour is obviously because last week, Orange Cassidy poured orange juice on it. Now, why he hasn't gone and got another jacket, or, you know, washed this one, well, you're going to have to ask Chris Jericho. Either way, he is going to take it out on that bulbous head Marco stunt or that fake dinosaur Luchasaurus. And they are the champion's words. They are not mine. Also, we all know that's Poppycock. I have seen Luchasaurus birth certificate. He is 100% a dinosaur. We also then had a video for a women's tag team tournament that AEW are going to run throughout the summer. And when all was said and done, I looked around my room like the crazy person that I am, nodding my head like a dog, and I was like, yeah, 
Yeah, this is something I want to see, but, but, woof, woof. It also negates all these people that were moaning last week going, well, why are Brandy Rhodes and Ali a tag team to begin with? They're not fighting for anything but wins. And I was like, man, do you even know what professional wrestling is? Well, now you have to shut up because AEW just gave you a reason. And also, if we do go around the roster and put some interesting pairings together, I am definitely up for this. And I think the winner gets a trophy or a cup. Everybody loves trophy or cups to the point I hit my microphone that probably made a noise. It's probably too soon as well given I think this is imminent that I really would like to see Britt Baker and Rebel as a team. Fingers crossed. We then had our Falls Count Anywhere match between the Young Bucks and the Butcher and the Blade and despite everything that we have seen recently in professional wrestling this was probably some of the most bonkers stuff and it was right up there. And given it was up there, it was getting it up. I mean, it started with the butcher and the blade in the back being butchers. They were just doing their job and I got a kick out of that. And obviously Matt and Nick Jackson were like, well, look, if it is going to be a false count anywhere, we're going to interrupt your work and we're going to start having a fight. So they did. From there, it was just mayhem. And between this and everything we did at the start of the damn show, with Cody, it was clear that All Elite Wrestling had decided we just need action, action, action. You could even say stuff that goes total nonstop. <laughs> what a crap joke. I mean, they brought around a trailer. They were fighting next to the stadium. At one point, I think the butcher just had a cookie tray smashed right into his head. There was no rules here, obviously. And it was just like being in a racing car. Nick also grabbed him and put him on an escalator. And as he was kind of going up against his will, I maybe had a little bit of a chuckle. It was also this horrific bit where they were back at ringside and a table was set up and the blade decided to run and dive over the top rope. But not only did he hit neither young buck, he also missed the table, which I think he was meant to go through to break his fall. And he just crumpled on a heap on a floor. It was absolutely horrible, and I genuinely hope he's okay. I think it's because someone gave you a call and checked. Butcher then got some kind of revenge because he cross-bodied Nick Jackson through another table, but this didn't work out well either because when he was back in the squared circle, he had double submissions applied. You know what's worse than one submission? Doubled submissions. Thankfully, at this point, the blade had got his head together and he made the save. The finish to this too. Do not forget, this was on free TV with essentially no real fans. Because Nick Jackson climbed up one of the entrance tunnels, Matt Jackson climbed up the other one, the Butcher and the Blade were like 72,000 feet below on tables, and they did a swanton, and they did an elbow drop, and they got the one, two, three. This, my friends, was some crazy shit. I'm gonna guess that AEW would hope that halfway through people were just going nuts on social media to get more eyeballs on this. <laughs> Although not Rey Mysterio's, because he can't do it, and it wouldn't surprise me if it did work. This was just... I mean, it was baffling. It was really, really good, and it was really, really fun, but it just came out of nowhere, and it kind of tired me out. I had to have a little bit of a lay down to rejuvenate all my energy. And then here it is, everything that I've been teasing, because Large Archer just wrecked everybody. He was asked by Alex Marvez, hey, man, why weren't you on Fight for the Fall? And I was like, Alex, what are you doing? Don't wind him up. And he was so put out by this question, he marched into the locker room, and he was just grabbing dudes and throwing them around, including taking one, and throwing him through the ceiling. The ceiling just exploded, that guy dead. Lars then clarified he will have official matches when he's good and ready, and when he does do this, everybody dies. So he's just walking around making murder threats and nobody can stop him. AEW, I think you made a terrible decision by signing this man, it's gonna wreck everyone. Back in the real world, I will say that this was absolutely needed because ever since Archer did arrive in AEW and had that really cool rise for his TNT title match against Cody, He's kind of faded into the background, and he's clearly an absolute badass. So let's get him back into a story, and let's do it yesterday. Right, I know like all companies that All Elite Wrestling is not only dealing with the global pandemic at the moment, but they're also dealing with injuries, and that is going to starve your roster. And it's probably why here we got Demonte versus Eva Lise. And look, both are really, really good. Both have the chops. I know they've been doing stuff on Dark and here and there and everywhere. And that it ties into the story with Shida, because she said last week, look, man, I'm happy to take on anybody, not just the top stars. Anybody will do. But this didn't really have the narrative or the momentum that everything else we did see on this week's episode of Dynamite did. And it kind of just fell a teeny weeny little bit flat for me. But because of that, down. It also ended with the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment when Diamante surprised Ivelisse with the surprise roll-up. And I don't mind when AEW does that because they barely ever do. However, in this sense, when you do decide to go this way with the finish, well, it always feels like a fluke. So no one really comes out the other side with any real momentum. 
And that's how I felt here. Although, to be fair, Diamante next week will be taking on Shida, I think, in a non-title match. So I'll wait and see. Big Swall also cut an inset promo here on Britt Baker. And I also felt that summed it up. It was like AEW was like, look at this instead, look at this instead. Obviously, Swall is suspended at the moment, but I tell you, when she come back, Britt Baker, you're going to have to roll away. Also, that's a cool story that you can get excited about. And I just think it would be nice if we did the same for these two as well. Maybe we will. We then had another match that had its roots in other shows. I've already mentioned this twice, so I'll mention it a third time, and then I'll just drop it. But show more clips from Dark and show more clips from BTE. If you're going to have them as a trilogy or a trifecta, you should be doing that. But it was Alan Angels, who's now with the Dark Order, taking on Hangman Page, who the Dark Order are very interested in. And I tell you, when it comes to narrative, this got me going. Just get it up. Obviously, Hangman did away with him kind of easily, although Angels did have some pretty badass offense here. But when the Cowboy had powerbombed him, he was able to get the one, two, three. But it was everything afterwards that we were meant to focus on. Because while the Dark Order had been watching on from ringside the whole time, it was here where Brody Lee came down. He got a microphone. He said, look, Cowboy. Look, Mr. Adam. Look, Mr. Page. I think you're wonderful. I think you're great. But you have no friends. Where's Kenny Omega? Where are people that are supposed to be watching your back if you come and join us? I promise you, that will never be a problem again. Cole Cabana also came out with Brody Lee, so you've got to keep an eye on that one. And clearly Hangman Page wasn't interested in this, although he should have chosen his words a bit more carefully because he said to Brody, look man, I don't want to join no cult. And Lee was like, don't you insult me. And he called down his boys. They started to whoop Hangman Page's ass because they had the numbers game. And do you know once again who came down to save him? It wasn't Kenny Omega. It wasn't Cody Rhodes. It wasn't the Young Bucks. It was FTR. They all cleared the ring. And it was only then that Omega ran out. And you could just feel the tension here. The tag team champions. And Hangman was like, where were you, pal? Omega was like, oh, just uh, a bit late. I was like playing video games. Hangman also accepted a beer from FTR. And you could almost see Kenny cry. And I think this is my favorite story in wrestling. I cannot wait for Kenny Omega to turn hill and just absolutely pulverize everyone. And then he should rise to the top and he should be the new AEW World Champion. I completely mean that. Just plug me in because I need it. Our main event was then Chris Jericho and Jake Hagar taking on the Jurassic Express. And it was just a rollicking good time. I felt like I was sitting on a train of fun. That's a horse. Who cares up? Jericho bumped around the place early on for Jungle Boy to remind you that he is a rising star. And as soon as Jake and Luchasaurus were in there, they were just taking lumps out of each other. But not literally. It was haymakers for days. At one point, Jungle Boy took out Santana and Ortiz who were at ringside. And throughout all that fracas, Marco Stunt was getting involved. And when Jungle Jack did hit like a springboard flatliner onto Jericho, he got such a near two count, it was like one, two, 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 two kick out. I actually thought he was going to win. And look, one day he will beat someone like Chris Jericho. And as long as we have crowds back, everybody is going to cheer like they've never cheered before in their life. The champion then wanted to use his bat, you know, Floyd, but Aubrey Edwards, the referee, put a stop to that. And again, this was more madness because Jungle Boy then rolled him up and got yet another near count. Just take everything I said and copy and paste it here. Luchasaurus eventually got the hot tag and he ran wild like the dinosaur that he is. And of course, then everybody heard the klaxon. You know how AEW tag team matches work. Uh, and as soon as you do hear that, everyone is allowed to get in the ring and just go crazy. It confused the ref, meaning that Stunt hit Chris Jericho with a missile drop kick. And once again, Luchasaurus then hit him with a big kick. And Chris Jericho has become the master of the near fall. There couldn't have been any extra time before he lifted his shoulder up. I actually thought Luchasaurus had won. Santana and Ortiz were then literally on the apron, but Jungle Boy took them out. And this was just so much for Aubrey Edwards. She started spinning around with confusion like she was a dreidel. I do have to say at some point we are going to have to have some ruling when it comes to this because officials in All Elite Wrestling occasionally chuck guys out of there like she could have gone to San Antonio or Ortiz. You are interfering too much, you've got to leave. But because she didn't hear, it just makes you scratch your head a little bit. There was a point to all of this, however, because Sir Pentago of all people then smashed Luchasaurus with the bat that he got off the floor. When he turned around, he got code breakered by Chris Jericho and it did mean that Jericho got the one, two, three, the inner circle had won. And I sat there going, why Sir Pentico? Why? Now this was not Sir Pentico, if you were wondering, because after the inner circle and he had given the Jurassic Express a whooping, he unmasked and it was Sammy Guevara. Now while Tony Schiavone did shout out, oh, that's not Sir Pentico, it's Sammy Guevara. Well, Sir Pentico has never unmasked now, has he, Tony? So maybe it was Sammy Guevara the whole time. 
Obviously, it wasn't, but I make my point. This mugging carried on until Orange Cassidy and the best friends did come out to calm everything down. And we are going to get that massive tag team match next week. And I think that could be absolutely badass. Of course, all of this does raise the question about whether Sammy Guevara had been taking off TV long enough and whether he should have been brought on back with like a traditional old school wrestling angle. Ultimately though, AEW did do the right thing when they suspended him. And if they truly believe that he's gone through the right processes, that he's educated himself and that he is now a better person, well, I think we've just got to give them the benefit of the doubt. We can't all be judge, jury, and executioner. When all was said and done, though, I thought this was an absolutely flipping great episode of AEW Dynamite, which started with a bang, and then had a bang in the middle with that Falls Count Anywhere match, and ended with yet more explosions. They clearly knew that they were coming off Fight for the Fallen and Fighter Fest, and they needed to do something huge, and I think they did. So like usual, I see you never give it a down. It's not my fault. Tell them to stop putting on such good shows is getting it up. Now, yeah, don't forget to leave a comment below and let me know how much you hate me. Like the video, share the video, subscribe to What Culture Wrestling. Then head over to whatculture.com, read yourself some articles, follow What Culture on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE, and watch more videos here on What Culture Wrestling. My name is Simon from What Culture. Thank you very much for joining me. As always, the wrestling keeps on coming, which means I keep coming back. I'll see you soon.